Be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Meta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm in conversation today with my friend and colleague, Amid Safi. Amid is a teacher in the Sufi tradition of radical love and the founder of Illuminated Courses and Tours. He is a professor at Duke University, specializing in Islamic spirituality and contemporary thought. The author of several books, his most recent release from 2018 is Radical Love, teachings from the Islamic mystical tradition. Omid offers online video-based courses through a range from Sufi approaches to the Quran to Rumi and spiritually oriented tours to Turkey and Morocco. He has been invited by the family of Dr. King to speak at Ebenezer Church on the relevance of Dr. King for today's America and delivered the Martin Luther King keynote in the annual national MLK service. Amid is also the host of his own podcast, the Sufi Heart Podcast, right here on the Be Here Now Network. It's such a great delight to welcome you back, Amid. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. It's always, always a joy to get to spend some time with you. It's wonderful just to hear your voice and even to be with you virtually. Where are you right now? I am in my home in Durham, North Carolina. Well, I'm in Barry, Massachusetts, and uh, we're recording this right after um, Hurricane Henri, and and it, uh, you know, we had no power for a good bit of yesterday, and I wondered what today was going to look like, and now I'm just hearing the rain coming down, but all seems to be working, so it's really good. So the last time we did a podcast together was 2018, and so much has changed since then. My goodness, that seems like. Life before. Yeah. Yeah, the before times, I'm told, we're we're calling them. You and I first connected when we were both regular columnists at On Being, and since then we've become friends and we've had the opportunity to teach together, which I hope will come more and more. Tell me what you're working on these days. Uh, I I was going to say, it it would be so wonderful to get to spend more and more time. Yeah, it would be. Um, so I'm, I'm working on a few things. Um, uh, we have a new baby, and uh, so muzzle tough, as we say. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, thank you. And uh, so, really, just getting to sit in awe of this enormous ancient soul in this very young and supple body. Uh, that's just uh, it's marvelous, and. Um, uh, and then I've, I've been working on uh, a couple of book projects, um, translating the works of this um, mystic from about a thousand years ago, um, right before the time of Rumi, in that uh, place very much like our friendship, where uh, the, the Islamic tradition and the Buddhist tradition met up in more or less what is today Afghanistan and Iran area. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of them. And then um, working on some more of these online courses for illuminated courses um, that may may come. Um, that has, it sort of started out as a quarantine project, but now it seems like, you know, these teachings have a, um, there's a need for them and, mm-hmm. and people are thirsty. And so um, I think I'm trying to figure out how to best make it accessible to people. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm in the early stages of working on a new book myself, and uh, that's part of what I wanted to, um, you know, glean some wisdom from you about today and and help me shape some of the ideas I've been having from your very deeply informed perception about 
uh, Islamic mystic tradition. I've been exploring kind of the larger arcs of a human life through the lens of expansion and contraction, hmm. knowing that, you know, as human beings, it's quite natural we experience both these poles and we can learn from both in many ways. But contraction, the way I'm using it is when we're fixated or we have tunnel vision, when we're clinging or grasping or or we're deeply afraid and expansion is when we feel connected to a bigger world. We see options. We have more perspective. There's openness. It's like we can breathe. Uh, when I think of the word love, interestingly enough, I realize it can be used to mean both things. You know, we can talk about love in the most fixated, obsessed, like narrow way. And we can also talk about love as the most vastly open and connecting way. And I'm wondering if that's why you you actually use the term radical love. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, You know, I think particularly for those of us who um, live in these Western countries, um, there, there is a tendency sometimes to make love quite small. Um, and by small, I mean very particular. Uh, you know, it seems like, I don't know, 80% of movies out there have, um, as the main theme or a sub theme, some kind of romantic love. And so do so many of the songs out there. Um, and, and it's something that's both ubiquitous and everybody seems to be talking about it. But then at the same time, I think people are thirsty and hungry and starved and looking for it. And I think part of that, and at least to some small uh, measure, what many of our traditions have to offer is that love doesn't have to be that small. It doesn't have to be so particular. It doesn't have to be only defined and confined to the romantic. And there's many kinds of love. There's the love of parents, the love of teachers, the love of people in your community, um, the love of the garden, of nature, of puppies, of babies. <laughs> um, and, and also, you know, what maybe was our foremost way of experiencing love at one point in life doesn't necessarily have to be what feeds our soul 20 years down the road. Um, so I think at that level, it does connect very much to that notion of contraction and expansion that you're talking about. Because, you know, if I'm, we just talked about how we have this new baby, right? Mm -hmm. And so today, and, you know, God willing, inshallah, for the rest of her life and my life, um, she will be someone that I will love. And she's that particular locus of devotion and care and compassion and sacrifice. Um, now, if I came up to her and said, well, you know, I do love you, little baby, but I just want you to know that you're a placeholder. And that <laughs> 20 years from now, I might move on from you to a <laughs> grandchild or something. Well, that's that's probably not the most enlightened way of, of approaching it. So I think there is this constant ebb and flow. And the more I think about it as we live in this ocean of love, um, which I think is one of the my favorite metaphor for how the people who talk about radical love talk about it. We live in this ocean of love, and like every ocean, it has waves that come to the shore and then recede back into the ocean. Uh, and it's still part of the ocean. Um, and I think to that extent, that connects me back to that radical love notion that, um, you know, the word radical originally had to do with being rooted. And I love that idea that every tree needs to have roots that anchor you, that help you draw up nourishment and sustenance. But then you grow and you expand your branches heavenward and you might provide shade and fruit far beyond where your roots are. Um, I think there's something to that metaphor of remaining rooted while reaching beyond where that original site is. Would you say that radical love um, has fewer kind of conditions or strings attached? Because 
Now I'm picturing you looking at your beautiful new baby and saying, I love you and, and you better be a scientist when you grow up or a poet or, you know, whatever. Well, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm an immigrant child, so that's uh-huh. not an abstract exercise uh-huh. for me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, we, 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 are, um, uh, we are raised with a massive amount of um, sacrifice and love and also the culture of guilt and shame of, mm-hmm. you know, your parents sacrificed for you, so you better be a doctor. And, mm-hmm. But you're, you're free to choose what kind of doctor <laughs> you might <laughs> right. Be, you know? right. And, um, and I was one of those rebellious ones who got into medical school and decided that, no, I wanted to pursue this <laughs> life about um, illumination and poetry and uh-huh. sainthood and things that I didn't even have the vocabulary for. Um, and, you know, I think that question of conditional, unconditional love is really um, uh, important. And I do find that in some ways, the, the purest of loves are a little bit like sunshine or rainfall or snowfall, that they, they just cover everything. But then there's a caveat. And mm-hmm. I think this caveat is something that um, in this new decade of my life that I'm entering, um, I'm, I'm learning to sit with it, and I'm, I'm curious about where it's going to go. Um, because this insight doesn't come from my Sufi books. It actually comes from listening to my friends mm-hmm. and, and learning from their lived experience and wisdom. And, and I have to be honest, a lot of it actually comes from women mm-hmm. who talk about how much of their life they have scattered their heart energy um, by giving of themselves, you know, like that giving tree book, uh, that many of us have this ambivalent relationship with, um, giving of themselves for others without necessarily being cared for in return. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my heart of hearts, I still lean into those teachings that see love as radical love as having an origin that's grander than us, that is more divine than us, more universal than us, the individual, um, like sunshine, like rainfall, like snowfall. But I think in this new phase of life, I'm also learning to really value not so much the condition nature of love, but the notion of boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that boundaries are also really important. Um, And interestingly enough, my Sufi sources don't have a whole lot to say about Uh that. Uh Um, They they sort of took a lot of that for granted. Um, And they lived in a world where those kinds of social boundaries and etiquettes tended to be universally practiced. Um, So they didn't feel the need to articulate it. But I think in today's world, sometimes it can be a kind of protection. I think that's uh, really true. And I think now I'm thinking about different things in the Buddhist tradition. And to some extent, um, there are times when in certain elements of the Buddhist tradition, this is all, as you say, it's implicit. It's it's taken for granted. And then there are other times that um, it's more explicit, and I feel very grateful for those. So, for example, in formal loving-kindness practice, you actually begin offering loving-kindness to yourself rather than to somebody else. And they say the underlying principle is that we're meant to do that practice in the easiest way possible. So the theory is that you yourself are easiest. You know, you yourself are worthy of your own loving care more than anybody else. And as a kind of foundation, now that's not necessarily true for us. Um, but, uh, it is, it is quite, um, you know, explicit, like we have to include ourselves. So even as we may be cultivating an enormous care and compassion for others, um, there, there needs to be, uh, something that is not abandoning ourselves, you know, there's a kind of equality there 
that's very intriguing. And there's also a whole teacher teaching about equanimity, which is the voice of wisdom. So that's the boundaries part. I've even seen translations saying boundaries, like I will help you, my friend, you know, whom I, I love, um, and you're having such a hard time and I will do anything, but I'm actually not in control of the universe. This is out of my hands ultimately. Right. And, you know, it's not meant to be cold or, uh, withdrawing or anything, but it's actually, it's boundaries, it's wisdom. Right. And, and that needs to be there. And so sometimes that's made overt and sometimes it's not so overt. And then I think you're totally right. You know, we, we end up not actually acting, say, from generosity of the spirit, but we're acting from a kind of martyrdom, which is a very different kind of action. That's right. That's right. And it leaves a different fragrance behind it. And you're raising a daughter, so. Yeah, which is, you know, <laughs> a, 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 one of the great um, uh, teachers in, in a lifetime. Uh, I have this newborn baby. I have a teenager daughter and then mm-hmm. a daughter who just turned 21. Um, and each one of them has uh, many lessons to teach. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I tell you, it's uh, for, for, for a person who sometimes, you know, goes on podcasts and uh, online courses teaching about spirituality. It's a wonderfully needed dosage of humility. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> So when you are considering, like you're trying to help somebody trust in this idea of radical love and also feel uh, not left out, you know, that this is something that they can actually learn to access or, or perhaps cultivate. And um, Do you think there are factors that allow us to more abide in radical love? And, and uh, clearly there are factors that sort of diminish it, like our own fear, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, what I've tended to experience is um, that on one hand, you want to be sharing uh, teachings and in particular stories and anecdotes that become friends to people and they get to accompany them on, on their journey. And, um, and you know, to some extent, it's a blessing in my life that um, I'm, I'm surrounded by some of these sources that do have so many of these wonderful uh, teachings and stories and sometimes translating them and sometimes expanding on them. Um, And then at the same time, you also constantly have to make a space for people to explore their own reaction to the teachings that you're sharing with them. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I found to be very helpful in terms of enabling people to explore this path of radical love is in whatever way, whether it's keeping a journal, whether it is um, sitting there in silence, meditation and, and reflection, to have each person explore what is it that feeds their soul. And this goes back to that idea of what fed your soul when you were 20 may not be what feeds your soul when you're 40 or 60 or 80. And then to see when is it that they feel most connected uh, to, to all, to other beings, to nature, to the universe. I would call that mystery of the universe God, um, even though I know that that's a word that sometimes is unhelpful for, for others. Um, I would want the God notion that is bigger and grander um, than, you know, the white bearded white guy in up in the sky somewhere. Um, and then to see is the time that they feel most luminous, most porous um, when they're sitting in the woods. Um, this summer at one point I had, this wonderful opportunity to take my newborn and to sit with her in that sacred place where the waves of the ocean were coming up to the sand and then receding. And I got to hold her in my lap very carefully (laughs) and 
have the waves come and wash from our toes to our knees to our thighs and then go back into the ocean. And I had wanted her to experience that. But then sitting there with her, I I felt so connected to this ocean. Um, And, you know, realizing that the ocean is made out of water and I'm made out of water and that the water that makes me has also come from the ocean. Um, And then all of a sudden, you know, something like, I don't know, death was not so frightening because there was a time that the water in me came from the ocean and now it has found life inside of me and there will come a time that will go back to the ocean. And there was a time that the dust, the clay of my body came from faraway stars and the time will come when it will go back there. Um, so at this point in my life, maybe sitting by an ocean is when I experience that sense of radical love and radical amazement most. There might be somebody else for whom that experience comes in meditation or comes in prayer or comes in reading a book of Rumi poetry. Mm -hmm. So to find whatever that practice that nurtures you in that most radical level, that most rooted level is, and then to return to that practice again and again and again until it becomes a habit. Uh, And this is one of the lessons I've learned from my friend Sharon, (laughs) who reminds me, and when we've had a chance to teach together, to say, and if you forget, and if you mm-hmm. mess up, it's okay. And be generous with yourself and be gracious with yourself. And I mean, that's one of those things that I haven't read a single Sufi book that says that mm. as clearly and as beautifully and as graciously as that. Um, that comes out of the lived experience. Um, so yeah, I think that sense of identifying what feeds our soul and returning to it. Thank you. That that's really beautiful. And I think, you know, of our time and how people are struggling. I mean, they were struggling anyway with loneliness, it seems, but certainly now and you know, I read those chats when I'm teaching on Zoom, for example, and you know, people are um not having the kind of external avenues they might have had so readily for a feeling of connection. And, you know, I read something recently from someone in a nursing home, she said, I haven't had a visitor in a year. Yeah. And and so I think it's so compelling uh, to try to do that discovery, to see how we can have the biggest possible sense of connection, even if it's not going to be the one we were relying on before. That's right. That's right. And, you know, there's, a, there's a, such a sense of, you know, some people talk about wanting things to return to the normal way. Mm-hmm. Other people talk about the new normal um, that we have to create together. Um, I hope that whatever that new normal will look like, that some small recognitions, you know, how much we would love to be able to sit across the table with loved ones uh, or with friends that we're still early in our friendship and get to know each other without worrying about if we're going to kill each other, based right. on, uh, <laughs> some virus that we're carrying. Or, you know, in, in, in my case, um, the blessing that it really is to hug your, your family members. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've said this to people, you know, we've, Many of us, myself included, you know, I've lived through a war, I've lived through a bombing, I've lived through immigration. I don't mean to say that, you know, COVID and the quarantine is harder than any of those other ones, right? Because you don't do an algebra of human suffering. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is unlike any of those other ones, because in every one of those previous challenging dark nights of the soul, I remember clutching most closely to my family. Mm -hmm. And and here I find that 
because I love them so much, I'm having to unclutch from them and I'm having to keep actually a distance from them. Uh, that's, that's different. <laughs> uh, and I do hope that if and when we are able to get back into it, that something as simple as, you know, holding the hand of a loved one or breathing the air in each other's presence will be something that we won't take for granted. And if we forget, um, that we return to that recognition. Mm. I recently saw that uh, you did an interview with Vox called What Would Rumi Do in a Pandemic, which is a great title. And I know you teach on Rumi a lot, and he is such an icon of Sufi mysticism. Um, can you tell us what Rumi would do in a pandemic? <laughs> well, uh, you know, he, he didn't have to live through COVID, but uh, around his time period, um, you know, there was, of course, the, the plague, and there was the Mongol onslaught, and there was lots of things that um, took the lives of many human beings. And the one thing that I tend to find um, that Rumi did is, uh, you know, he has this beautiful analogy um, of being like water. And for him, that meant that if you pour any cup of water, it always flows down. Um, and his analogy was, this is what pure love is, is that you always gravitate towards where the greatest pain and the greatest suffering is. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I find that to be um, such an instructive model of what it means to live a life of love, whatever name you want to put on it, radical love, compassion, real love. Um, th there has to be a response of compassion. And that compassion at one level starts with the people who find themselves in the greatest of suffering. And, and it might be someone who's COVID positive. It might be, um, you know, an undocumented person uh, today and tomorrow. It may look like an Afghan refugee. Mm -hmm. um, and... But that notion of turning um, in compassion to where the pain is and not excluding your own self from it. I would think that these are some of the um, lessons that, that he would have to, to offer. And then there's some challenging parts um, which don't really jive so well in our modern world such as the fact that, you know, he gets to the point where death is um, not something that's frightening for him. Um, and he just says, you know, I've already died a thousand deaths in my life. Mm -hmm. And there's always been a rebirth and a resurrection. Um, and, you know, he sort of sees this evolution of um, consciousness, uh, he has this beautiful poem, I died the death of the mineral and I was reborn as the plant. I died the death of the plant. I was reborn as, um, as the animal. Um, why should I ever fear death? When was I ever made less by dying? When I die, uh, give out the chariot's call and watch me be resurrected as something that the angels will stand in awe of. Mm. Um, and that that's a really powerful and beautiful and very challenging message because in some ways um, our world is so connected to the sensory and the tangible and the physical and that um, the uncertainty of the after is um, is very frightening for a lot of us. You know, I realize that um, I tend to have some phrases from the Buddha that I repeat to myself in times of uncertainty, or especially in times of adversity. And some of them are challenging. Like um, probably my favorite is uh, a favorite in a certain sense is. Uh, Hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. 
this is an eternal law. And that is not an easy message, actually, in so many times. And I'm wondering if there are particular phrases from Rumi that you uh, you hold in that way in your life. You know, there's a, there's there's quite a few of them, and um, it's a little bit like being in um, in a garden where you pick the flower that that appeals to you, or maybe. Um, if we were grand people, we would say in an apothecary where <laughs> you would receive the medicine um, that uh, that is that is intended uh, sort mm-hmm. of for you. Um, but you know, he has this one beautiful um, kind of set of teachings that uh, is called um, his uh, "You and I" poem, um, and that's one that um, has been very meaningful to me in a number of contexts and. Um, and I love how fluid it is because it could be about you and a friend. It could be about you and a romantic partner. It could be about you and that mystery of the universe, God. Um, and, and he just says, um, he talks about friendship. Um, and so it's not addressed to a person. It's just addressed to the faithful friend. Um, and he says, Faithful friend, come, come closer. Um, let go of a you and an I. Come, come quickly. You and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. Mm. Um, you and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. Um, and, and there's something so comforting and reassuring about there is another way possible, um, that we're not bound to live in this state of the binary, whether it's two individuals, two perspectives, two nations, two religions, um, that there is a grander all of us. There's a grander we uh, where no one is excluded and everyone is included. Um, And I do come back to that one quite often. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, um, you know, I think sometimes (laughs) I was recently thinking of that where we're having an intense conversation with um, my teenager. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was so easy to get sucked into that perspective of, you know, you said this, but I know this. Um, And as if, you know, truth is a pizza pie that has to be divided up Mm. in a Mm -hmm. certain way. Um, But then, you know, if you could sort of think of it as each one of us experiences reality from a certain vantage point and that, um, you know, her vantage point as long as she's not causing harm to herself or others around her, um, is is just as valid as as mine. As long as I'm not causing harm to myself or someone around me, um, and it did it did help to shift the the tenor of that conversation and the nature of that that dynamic. And I'd love to be able to return to that kind of an awareness more frequently. That's really, I'm going to adopt your phrase, Rumi's phrase, I should say, <laughs> which is, is really extraordinary. And it also makes me think of the idea of curiosity, which is so mm-hmm. often inaccessible when we're in that kind of stuck place of judging ourselves or we're judging others. And I wonder if you could say something about curiosity and about the conscious cultivation of it. Yeah. You know, I think um, I'd be curious <laughs> uh, to hear what you have to say about mm-hmm. it. Um, uh, I, I, th- I think the, the couple of things that come to my mind is curiosity for me is always tied to humility. Um, mm-hmm. And I remember once having read in the biography of one of these great medieval mystics that, um, you know, there was a seeker who came to visit him 
And, you know, the guy had traveled quite a long distance and travel was challenging in those days. And he says that, uh, you know, there were 28 people in the room and, um, and he was the last one to get to ask a question. And he said 26 people asked their question and to each one of them, he simply said, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Um, I may not be the best person to answer this question. Um, and he's, you know, and there was this sense that like, you know, the first or second time he was like, okay, wow, well, that's kind of humble of him. And then after a while, the guy was getting a little annoyed Mm -hmm. of like, well, I've come this long way to hear your pearls of wisdom. Um, and I was thinking how different that is from the way that many people, and if I'm being honest, myself among them, tend to act at times when we're asked almost any question um, about spiritual matters, religious matters, social issues, political issues. We have something to say, and if we don't have something to say, we make up something to say. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to remember, when was the last time, not with friends one-on-one, but in a public setting, that somebody asked me a question to which I simply said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I do find that that humility about I care enough about you, the person in front of me, to know that I may not have the right answer for you, but here's somebody else who may, or the answer may lie within you to that, to that extent. Um, I think that's, that's one. And th- there's one other beautiful insight that um, it's a throwaway line, um, but there's this amazing Sufi allegory called The Conference of the Birds, um, by Attar. So this is what Rumi grew up reading, basically. And it's a, it's a story of 30 birds that set out to meet the king bird, uh, or as I used to call it, the big bird. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't yellow, and it wasn't seven feet tall. And, you know, the allegory is, is so rich and so wonderful. But once the birds... And the birds are, of course, symbolizing the spirit or the soul on the quest. Once they make the determination to set out on the path, the first thing that they see is that the path is empty. And I love that sense of curiosity that Mm -hmm. any spiritual journey, you know, it's not a GPS direction. Mm -hmm. And it's not a direction, turn by turn direction that somebody else has written in a book, even if that person is as brilliant as a Rumi or a Buddha or a Muhammad or whoever. Um, The path is to some extent empty because you will find on the path what you're bringing with you to the path. And the path may be trodden There might have been others who've gone before you, but the actual experiences on the path are going to tie and connect to what you're bringing. Uh, And I think that's also an element of curiosity or self-discovery. You're not just learning about the path. You're learning about who you are, what you are. Um, And there is that unveiling, layer by layer unveiling of the heart, um, which it's it's the most awesome mystery of the universe. Mm. It's beautiful. You know, you reminded me of this time I was sitting and having breakfast with a rabbi. We were at the same conference somewhere or another. And I asked him a question uh, phrasing it like, does Judaism say blank, blank, blank? And he said, which Judaism? Right. And I realized, oh, right. You know, like these traditions are so rich and intricate and uh, mutable. They change, you know, not maybe essentially, but in form and, you know, emphasis and so many things. And and so, um, you know, we won't find the answer in, in some kind of 
holding in a rigid way. And it also reminded me, of course, when I was first teaching, I was very young. I was 21. Almost everybody I was teaching was older than I was. And and the thought of saying, I don't know, was like terrifying, you know, like, and so I would take refuge in, well, according to Buddhism, you know, I didn't have the notion of like which Buddhism and, you know, what, what resonates with me and what do I simply not know? And, um, you know, and it was actually, a, I think, a growing up on my part and uh, to be able to say, I don't know, or even to be able to say, well, according to the Theravadan tradition in Buddhism, it's this, you know, instead of saying it's this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's kind of you know making it um, specific of 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 saying you know you don't just cook a meal and tell someone you put spices in it, right? Uh, right? <laughs> you know, it's like well, what kind of spices and in what measure and when do you add it? Um, and I've tended to find that when somebody says. Um, Judaism says, Buddhism says, Islam says, um, they're really doing one of two things. They're either making themselves the mouthpiece of a whole tradition mm -hmm. or they're privileging one particular school or thinker uh, or tradition within that vast ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I... Um, I remember some 20 something years ago, I wrote this thing of like, Islam doesn't say anything. Uh, Islam doesn't get up in the morning. Islam doesn't brush its teeth. Islam doesn't shower and Islam doesn't have breakfast. Muslims do. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Muslims do and say many different things, but at times they coalesce and at times they diverge. Um, and so I think, yeah, that sense of like, well, you know, this part of the Theravadan tradition says, and sometimes I'm reminded that, you know, Rumi's tradition, it's largely an ecstatic tradition built around music and poetry and intense devotion to the prophet and the earlier saints. But there's also other Sufi traditions, which are very sober, very meditative. They don't have any interest in music. And that's an equally beautiful tradition. It just may not look like Rumi's tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so I think adding that, that sense of particularity, um, this might be circling back around to what you were talking about, contraction and expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, where every one of these teachings and teachers um, points us and maybe they're meant for different people in different walks of life. Maybe they're meant for different temperaments. Maybe they're meant at different stages of life. Um, so I think to have that sense of remaining open and curious about uh, how is my heart receiving this? Mm -hmm. And is this somehow pulling me into um, that grander mystery? Um, some people could phrase it as, does this help me feel closer to God and humanity and nature? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and um, not, not saying, is this easy or is it hard? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Any real spiritual path does involve challenging growth. Um, but is this filling me with that sense of light and connection? It's wonderful. I want to switch gears for a moment to talk about mm -hmm. another big thing that's emerged from the past few years, um, which is accountability and re restorative justice, which I know is dear to your heart. And maybe that's a little bit connected to what we were talking about with boundaries. How do you yeah. think about accountability these days personally? And how do you feel that evolves into our collective understanding? Yeah, you know, is um, I think in so many of us um, have this beautiful way of uniting different traditions, and uh, you know, I've heard you talk about having come from a Jewish background and having found the home in the Buddhist tradition. You know, I think for me, it was coming from a Muslim background and being moved to the core of my being by the Black prophetic tradition mm -hmm. of a 
Martin Luther King and a Vincent Harding and a John Lewis and Ella Baker, and Fannie Lou Hamer and, and, and these, these friends. Um, and, and then, you know, my home continues to be the, the, uh, the Muslim tradition, but it's always in dialogue with the teachings and the insights of this um, black led tradition. And so a lot of us have heard, you know, this saying, uh, I think Cornell West, is probably the person who's most commonly associated with it. When love comes into public, we recognize it as justice. Mm -hmm. Um, And such a beautiful notion that justice isn't some economic notion of dividing up finite resources. Um, Justice is public love. Um, is that's all it is. Is if, if you love your neighbor, if you love your parents, if you love your partner, if you love your child, you wouldn't want to see them be homeless and bombed and occupied and degraded. Well, don't you dare be silent when it's somebody else's parent or baby or neighbor or friend who's, who's having those atrocities done to them. Um, and so this deep sense of a connection between love, which for me, as and this is one thing I've learned from the Sufi tradition, love is the anchor. Love holds the center. Um, love is the ocean. And then justice are like the different waves that may extend out of that ocean of love into the public arena, but it's got to come back to love. And I've definitely seen my own share, um, not just in my community, but in a lot of the activist circles that I've been around, where the work of justice is only fueled by outrage. Um, And I think that's okay, because there's a lot of stuff that you see around the world where, including in our own communities, where if you're not outraged by what you see, maybe you're not paying close enough attention. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the question is when that outrage turns into rage and then you lose touch with the love that inspired you in the first place. Um, And I think my hope is that we can keep an open heart and a sense of curiosity about how that concern for the well-being and the well-doing of the planet and the people of the small planet has to do with the notion of love and the restoration of actually all of us. In, I do think there's such a thing as situations in which one party is the oppressor and one is the oppressed. I don't think a sort of all lives matter language gets us to the point that we want to get to, but I hope that we can make room for a kind of justice practice where the goal is actually the dignity and the well-being of all of us, including those who right now find themselves on the wrong side of history. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to the. No, it's fabulous. Gen- Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm always, um, you know, I realize that I have developed the personal habit of uh, kind of using myself as the laboratory if I'm trying to understand something. So, if I look at a uh, quality like forgiveness and part of that exploration, I really ponder like, what does it mean to forgive myself, and what does it mean to not forgive myself, and what are the consequences of that? And I do the same thing in terms of that kind of rage, you know, that you were describing or, or other incredibly contracted states where I realize that when I'm in that state, um, I, I lose a sense of options. It's like the world shrinks and, and it's from that place that I or we might do something that we actually might regret quite a lot later on. Yeah. You know, and, and so it's trying to understand just kind of the real life 
consequences of being lost in a kind of contracted, limited state or the consequences of being more open? Do we then get foolish? Do we then overlook some real problems? Or, or is there a way, just as you're describing, of having this kind of immense openness of heart and a great clarity and precision about our actions, you know, so that they're, they're forceful, they're, they're very directed. I don't know, like, if we look back, any of us, on 10 years ago, mm. uh, doing things that maybe we felt were okay at the time, and now we know we're not so great, you know, and that they had consequences. Um, that seems to be an important understanding that is the missing link for a lot of people to realize that actions have consequences. That's right. And so many people do those kinds of things. I mean, we all do them, but some people to a very great and harmful degree. And um, it can feel overpowering, but uh, I think that's really the, the universal lesson that needs to, to happen, that actions do have consequences. And it sounds like what you're also saying is that in order for us to learn those lessons about our own life, it calls for a personal reckoning as well mm -hmm. and, an, and an examination and an exploration of what has unfolded in our own life and in our own journey. Um, and sometimes I do worry that the pace of life is so intense, so all-consuming that the insistence on having those spaces for inner exploration, um, it, it's a very countercultural move these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except here we are, thrust on ourselves, you know, <laughs> like uh, in this weird particular time. Um, yeah. So we'll see. I wonder if you can, uh, lastly, speak a little bit about presence and what role does presence play in, in all of this? Like in this last challenge, like, you know, being countercultural and going against the tide and, and really feeling like, what do I need right now in, in order to be more whole and act in a better way? What does the practice of being present mean to you? Yeah, what a wonderful question. Um, you know, there's a um, there's a wonderful Sufi named uh, Hujviri um, who lived about a thousand years ago, and he has this wonderful practice. It's so simple <laughs> to say. And, and challenging to, to live and to come back to. And he just says, you know, have your heart be where your feet are. Um, and I think partially what he's encouraging us to do is that it's so easy for us to either um, project ourselves into the future and to think about all the things that we hope will happen or all the things that we might be afraid will happen uh, or to dwell on the past than to think about all the things that hurt us or maybe some sweet memories in the past. And we're basically everywhere except the here and the now. Um, but the work can only be done in the here and the now. Um, so one of the consequences and one of the incentives for this way of being present is in... Um, the Eastern Muslim cultures, so the, the places where the language has been Persian or Turkish or Urdu, um, one would never say um, Jesus, Muhammad, and Buddha walked into a garden. You would always say um, Hazrat Jesus, Hazrat Muhammad, and Hazrat Buddha walked into a garden. And that word Hazrat means presence. Mm -hmm. um, that these are people who are so fully and completely present to their own breath, to their own sacredness, that where they are present, the mystery of the universe 
or if you would, God is present. And it encourages you when you're in their presence to be present to yourself. Um, so that's the kind of um, reminder that, um, you know, wonderful line of Rumi, um, wherever you are, be the soul of that place. Be Wherever you are, be fully present there. Wherever you are, sanctify that place through your presence. Wow, um, that's really extraordinary. Mm. It, and, and it changes. That's right. And it just, you know, what I, what I find is that um, when we have a chance to practice this, to have our hearts where our feet are, so that when we're having this conversation, you, Sharon, my dear beloved friend, you are the most important person in the world to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wholeheartedly present with you. Um, and then the, the space is sanctified. And the conversation may it be sanctified and may it bear fruit. Um, but then as you were talking about, you know, then after um, our conversation reaches its fruition, um, then we can also gently lower it to the ground and we move on to the next person on our life's journey. And we don't keep dwelling um, and, and clutching back uh, at it because we'll have to be present in the next moment. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I think that's a really beautiful, um, beautiful notion of um, sanctifying places by being wholeheartedly present. Well, I'm going to take that with me as well. Thank you. I'm wondering if to close our conversation, you could lead us in a guided practice or meditation of some kind. Yeah, I would be honored to. I'd be honored to. So um, this is one of the um, earliest of the meditative practices, and it um, comes out of the Chishti tradition, the South Asian Sufi tradition. Um, and um, uh, it starts by you sitting comfortably, um, perhaps sensing your feet on the ground. Um, if you're seated in a chair, maybe feeling your thighs and your backs against the chair. Um, and then taking a few moments to take in some breaths, um, three or five. And you don't want to hold on to the breath, but you want to be able to observe your chest expanding and contracting. Uh, sometimes uh, if I've had a busy day, I find it helpful to put my own hand on my chest. And um, so we're going to do this maybe five times with this first part and just take in some breaths. Then we add an element to it, which is as the breath enters your heart, your chest, we become aware of the beating of the heart. And so you direct your breath, you direct your consciousness to that beating of the heart. And we'll do that about five times. In the next set of cycles, we're going to come right back to that beating of the heart, but then 
you might start to notice that if you pay attention to it, it's not only beating in your chest, but that you can feel that pulsation and that beating uh, throughout your body, maybe near your fingertips or your toes, that actually your whole body is moving and expanding and contracting. going to end the practice by something that is called the elemental breath. So, so many traditions talk about uh, the purification of the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, and uh, we're just going to do one of them, which is the purification of the, of the earth element. And to do this, uh, we're going to take in a breath from the nose, through the nose. You'll see if you can sense that pulsation in the heart or through the body. And then you're going to release that same breath, almost like an old oriental carpet that is being unfurled. And you're going to watch that breath roll away from you, roll through the room, across the hills, up into the horizons. The breath that is coming to you has visited every tree, every branch, every garden. There's one air, and it is the earth breath through the nose and out from the nose. And we'll do that one five times, and then we'll come back together. Right. And what's so lovely about these kinds of practices is that, um, you know, one can take part in them from any tradition. And you can, there's no set time of the day that one has to engage in them. Um, you can do them uh, anytime, any place. Um, find yourself just maybe having become a little um, out of sorts, out of balance um, to observe that breath coming in and out of the heart. And um, it's no wonder that so many of our traditions tend to have uh, similar practices about the observance of the breath. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, so delighted, really rejoicing in having gotten to be with you, Amit, in both with words and in silence. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And to learn more about Omid, visit www.illuminatedcourses.com. It's I-L-L-U-M-I-N-A-T-E-D-C-O-U-R-S-E-S.com. And you can listen to his podcast, The Sufi Heart, also on the Be Here Now Network. Big thank you uh, to everybody out there. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy, and may you live with ease. 
Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.